Distortion is static, man. I hear Prince Paul's in town, man. I want to go talk to him. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hey, hey, uh, Prince Paul? Is that you? Is that you? No, no, but I heard Nelly was over there. Oh, oh, Nelly? Uh, all right, all right. Uh, if you hear about Prince Paul, man, let me know, man. Uh, all right. Uh, I started with a group called Stetsasonic, and that was in the mid-'80s. Wow, that's a long time ago. We had a song called Talking All That Jazz that was a little popular, I guess, in, in, like in the late-'80s. And then uh, from there was De La Soul, Three Feet High and Rising, uh, De La Soul's Dead, Blue Mind State. And after that, it was a whole bunch of things. Um, Big Daddy Kane, Queen Latifah, MC Light, Boogie Down Productions, Slick Rick, um, The Jazz, Jay-Z. Um, man, it goes on. Uh, and from that point, the Grave Diggers, which was with a good friend of mine named the RZA, uh, Poetic, unfortunately, passed away, and Fruquan, who was in Stetsa Sonic. And I guess a little later than that, um, Chris Rock, uh, Roll With The New, Bigger and Blacker, and the new one, Never Scared. Two of those won Grammys, like the first two. Uh, Handsome Boy Model School, which is present date, which is white people. Uh, Man, I could, you know, I could go on for a long, I thought, there's a ton of things I'm missing. And I'm not saying like for bragging wise, it's like for time wise for your show. But uh, Prince Among Thieves, which is my own record, Psychoanalysis, Politics of the Business. I have a new instrumental record that's out now called It's, it's, called it's True Mental and a group called The Dicks. That's spelled D-I-X, so I don't know if you want to edit stuff out, you know. It's safe. It's good. Yeah. All right, well, okay, we'll save a little time. We'll end it there then. <laughs> All right, well, De La, we all went to the same school together. Like, uh, put it like this, let's put it in age group. Like, I was in 12th grade. Uh, True Goy, who's Dave, was in 11th. Uh, Pass was in 10th, and Maceo Mace was in 9th. And so, you know, I was that first guy in our school that kind of made a record. And um, Maceo, who was a DJ, uh, told me, he's like, hey, man, I got this group, De La Soul. Um, you know, you should check them out. You know, they're really, really good. And the reason why we got that far is because Maceo was DJing for another guy named Gangsta B at the time. And we was, and was making a, a beat for him, and it wasn't something we really particularly cared for. And so he said, I got a group daylight. They'll, they'll do whatever, you know, whatever you're down for, whatever ideas you got. And he brought those guys over, and I was like, wow. <laughs> you know, first I was like, I know the MC. Get out of here. And second of all, they brought a really rough song of a song we did called Plug Tuning. And I took it and kind of just revamped it and started working together. It was a good chemistry. Like, we worked well together. So it was, it was cool. Yeah, so um, you also were kind of, uh, you didn't, I don't know if you created, but innovated the skit, you know? Like, with, with the De La Soul albums, you know, you told a whole story, right. you know? And with, you know, Prince, Among, Prince of Thieves, you, you, you know, you, it was a story from beginning to end. Um, you want to talk about, you know, why you did that and then, you know, how that came about well the whole skit thing you know yeah i guess I'm, unfortunately i am like the uh inventor guy of the hip-hop skit yeah. you're doing skits and stuff but um i did it for Dela for the fact that we were at the end of making our record and i wanted something to tie in the record together i wanted people to kind of know who they were and their identity and their names so the best way of doing it was i was like well let's just do a game show because when the game shows back in the days used to like Hi, I'm such such from wherever, and I'm a, I'm a homemaker. You know, so I was like, wow, if I do that, but with them, when people listen to the album, they can identify with everybody. Because the problem I had then with listening to rap albums was sometimes you just didn't know who the MC was. You know, you didn't get a vibe for him. So I did it for that, and next thing you know, it kind of came a staple for hip hop records, which wasn't my intention. But you know, I guess it's flattering. But some records really don't need them. <laughs> you know, so that record I felt needed them, but when you put them on just to put them on, it's you know something different. Okay, so I mean, you known back then you were doing like you know, uh, they were they were kind of almost typecasted as like the happy hip hop, you know, like the hippies of hip hop, you know. And then you you came out with Grave Diggers, you know. I mean, uh, how did that come about? Hooking up with RZA and then doing the Grave Digger stuff. Wow, yeah, the the De La Soul thing. I mean, going back to what you're saying, like being happy or whatever the case is. You know, on their first tour, what was the first tour or second tour? They got kicked off for beating up people. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know, people kind of took that as, like, these guys look a certain way, but they're kind of big, man. <laughs> they were knocking cats out for a while. But, I mean, what kind of led to the Grave Diggers was just depression. Like, I was just going through a period, I guess, after doing the second Daylight record, um, 
which was De La Soul's Dead, in which I kind of felt I kind of lost a foothold, I guess, in wherever production rank I felt I was at. And so I tried to get cats who were in a similar predicament, who was uh, Prince Rakim, which everybody knows is RZA, uh, Fruquan, who got, I don't, I'd kind of say he got kicked out of Stet. Like he said, he, he just kind of tossed up between he left or he got kicked out and Poetic, who was homeless at the time. So I got everybody who was downtrodden and in a bad situation. This is pre-Wu-Tang for, for, for the RZA. And I put together a group of guys who was just like in a bad way. And that's why the Grave Diggers just sounds so dark and it has a certain vibe to it because we we're just trying to pool all of our talents together so we could uplift each other. You know, like I, I wanted to put my name back up in production. RZA wanted to get back out as an MC and as a producer and you know, Poetic and Fuquan would become, like, I guess, MCs, like, kind of known in their own right. And so Grave Diggers was supposed to be, like, a launching pad for, like, everybody to come out as individuals afterwards, you know, to kind of build a name up. And that's why it's so dark, man. Everybody was just angry and depressed, <laughs> you know. But I, I love that album. That's, like, probably out of all the records I think I've ever done, that's probably my favorite album. Yeah, I mean, it's a good album. Um, one thing, when I listen to it, it's it's... The production-wise, it's it's hard to tell who did what. I mean, producing the album, how was it to work with RZA? And, and I mean, did you guys influence each other on it? Or did you do the production? Did he do the production? Did you guys produce it together, you know, individually or together on each track? Well, for, for the first album, for Six Feet Deep, I did 95% of the production. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, like, RZA, his whole thing, what he wanted to do was kind of lay back and be an MC. When it came down to the second album, which is uh, the pick, the sickle, and the shovel, that was primarily Riz's influence in his productions and his production team. So, you know, we kind of, like, switched places. Like, I, I really didn't want to do a second album, so it was a good opportunity for Riz to kind of do, do his thing. But us working together, you know what's cool is when you respect each other, it makes it easy to kind of, like, bounce ideas off. So, for example, if I was doing a, a track on the first album, he's like, yo, I, I think I got a violin or something that might be kind of cool. Me trusting him, knowing that he's not going to put anything whack on it, makes it easy. And vice versa. It's like, you know, if he's working on something like, yo, make crazy, that beat's all right, but let me put this beat. He knows I'm not going to, like, make it corny. So it make, when you have respect, it just makes it so much easier as opposed to, like, having to look over his shoulder like, all right, man, that key ain't right, man. You know, I could walk out the studio and make sure it's going to be good, you know. And he's proven it a thousand times, man. He's like, he's the RZA, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's like, who's to say, you know. Okay, so and then now up until today, you hooked up with Dan the Automator, created Handsome Boy Modeling School. Um, first off, how did you hook up with Dan the Automator? Uh, I met Dan the Automator. Actually, I met him over the phone. Like, I did a record in the mid-'90s, I think in 96, called Psychoanalysis, which is like a real bizarre record. And he had a record out that he's putting out called Dr. Octagon, which I'm sure everybody knows out here. It was a huge record. Um, and a friend of mine was who owned the label that put out Psychoanalysis was reviewing his record for Rolling Stone, reviewing Dr. Octon for Rolling Stone. So I got a first listen of it. I was like, yo, that's crazy. Who did the beats? And he's like a guy named Dan the Automator. I was like, where is he from? He's like from, he's, you know, out in, in San Francisco on the West Coast. I was like, wow, you know, I'd really like to one, to meet him. And two, it might be cool if we toured together because he had a doc, he had like, you know, like this, the Dr. Octagon, I had Psychoanalysis, which is like a psychiatrist. Let's do a crazy tour. So we spoke over the phone. And find out we had a lot in common and, uh, you know, kind of sparked off a whole lot of stupid, nerdy conversations. And one being Handsome Boy Marlin School. And then we decided to make a group called Handsome Boy Marlin School. You know, your music is, is you, you capture a broad audience, you know. Um, you get people that, that of all races listening to it. Um, old folks that's been into hip-hop for the longest time and young folks. Um, what, how do you feel about the direction that hip-hop today is going you know, typical music on the radio or just in general? You know, it, it has its pros and its cons. I think the pros is the fact that it's worldwide and you can make a, a decent living off of, you know, hip-hop music. And just, you know, yeah, just definitely hip-hop music in general. Like, there's more opportunities as far as, like, you could sell your stuff on the net. Um, one, you get a lot more respect than you did, like, in the early 80s when I started, you know. Like when you say hip hop now, people are like, wow, it's somewhat credible. Even though people automatically think of violence and, you know, everybody was sagging pants and stuff. But, you know, but still it has a credibility and it charts and it makes a lot of money. Uh, I think the bad side of it is uh, it's and it's just overly commercialized, I think, in a lot of sense. Like 
it's not as special like when you just hear it on every other like commercial or whatever. I mean, but it, it, like I said, it goes against that because it's everybody making money off the music now and living off of it. But at the same time, it's the the whole concept to me, especially when I was growing up, was just it being underground and kind of voice of the streets and you know kind of like rebel music but it's not like that anymore so it's taken on like a different feel and different vibe i just think uh, unfortunately like the majors aren't really looking to be creative anymore like they're really looking to make money which is understandable but it kind of hinders the uh i don't know just like it kind of lays back the um the art i mean check this out like from like let's say the 70s to the 80s Hip hop has made, um, let's say, Lee's, which wasn't designed to be hip hop. They made that hip hop. They made Pro Kids hip hop. They made Adidas Shelto's hip hop. They made, I guess, in, in the early 90s or late 80s, Timberland hip hop. They made all these things hip hop. Like, hip hop has not advanced much in the last five, seven, eight years where everybody makes clothing that's hip hop. They make stuff like that's kind of marketed towards that, but. Hip hoppers, there's no new dances. Everybody's still break dancing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That there hasn't been too much of anything new that came out. People still beat boxing. People are still, um, they're still like, okay, turntables, they've changed as far as like the technology, but nobody's created a new way of really, really like scratching. They're trying to do iPods and stuff, which, yeah, yeah. but nothing new has really come out of it. You know, like nobody has created anything new, you know, and that's what I think it's, it's, it's messed up. You know, it's like, it stopped at a certain point, but nothing has developed. Everybody's still doing graph, which is you know, which is good. Everybody's still rhyming. They rhyme a little different, um, but there's nothing. I haven't heard anything that you know. Somebody's like, "Wow, this is a new part of hip hop." It's just the same things, but just kind of updated. So, so that kind of shows how how ahead of its time hip hop was actually in a way. Um, I mean, what would you like to see? Where where would you like to see it go? Um. Man, I don't know. I just like to see people. I just like to see people be a little more open to create different things because when I see different artists, it motivates me, and I hear different sounds, it motivates me. But when I hear the same thing over and over again, I, do, I my mind can't go beyond that. You, you know what I'm saying? I, I like because, like for example, like this is pretty old, but when I heard uh, N.W.A. Niggas for Life. Like, to me, that was like, oh, my God, this is incredible, blah, blah, blah. And it made me want to go and make stuff. Maybe not exactly like that, but it was inspiring. And then, or you heard EPMD, you heard Public Enemy, anything that, it was so diverse. But now, if I listen to the radio, it's all the same thing. And maybe I'm not into that thing, so I can't feed my inspiration off of that. Or if I go even to the underground stuff, like, a lot of cats are sounding the same. So it's like, you know, even underground used to be, like, experimental, like, Diff- there was different sounds in underground. Now underground is a specific sound. Either they didn't want to sound, unfortunately, they want to bite and sound maybe like Pete Rock or maybe like Premier or, you know what I'm saying? So I'm like, eh, come on, where's like, I want to hear some changes. That's the only thing that bothers me. I mean, I, I like hip hop. I-, I love it. You know, I'm down for whatever. But I just want to hear some change. I want to hear somebody just take an advance it to another level. You know, I like I always say like, when I when I when I started out, like biting was a crime. Now biting is cool. So it's like it's weird. It's like, what sound he used? We're gonna use the same thing. Like before, it's like, man, we can't do that. He already did that. So I like to see where biting is a crime again, and then we can kind of go back to keep on building a little better. Well, I think it's it's more like biting is safe nowadays, cause you know, cause it's so it's so big. You know, they gotta stick to a formula, cause it's working. You know what I mean? So um, so then where where are you taking it then now? I'm just experimenting. Like, every record you hear, I'm not going to say is the hottest record, you know, because people like it. Stuff, stuff I do is just, like, extreme. Either you really love it or you really hate it. But I'm risky with every record I make because I don't make records that are like the last record. Like, even my De La Soul records aren't exactly like the same ones. Like, Three Feet Behind Rise sounds different than De La Soul's Dead. De La Soul's Dead sounds different than Grave Diggers. Grave Diggers sounds different than Handsome Boy. Handsome Boy sounds different than Prince Among Thieves. So... I don't play it safe. I just play, I just do whatever I feel and how I like to do things. So, I mean, that's the way I'm trying to, like, advance it. it it's just by hopefully stumbling on something that, I'll, you know, that I'll go, wow, that's crazy. And maybe it'll influence other people to do something different. Or even better yet, what I really want to do is make a new genre of music. And I haven't, 
I'm, I'm working on that. Like, you know, I want to just, you, you want to shake the world. And a lot of people don't want to do that. They just want to make money. I want to shake the world. I want to change the way people see music and start a new lifestyle, a new trend or whatever the case is. And I think hopefully before, you know, the end of my lifetime, I will come up with something like that where, you know, you're like, man, if it wasn't for Prince Paul, I wouldn't be wearing this space outfit. <laughs> he changed the whole way I live, man. And he made this new style called space music. So you go in the store, well, do you like hip hop, rock, space music, country, <laughs> western? <laughs> you know, I, wanna, I want that, you know what I'm saying? That's what I want to do. <laughs> you know? People know, should know out right now, we have uh, Handsome Boy White People, which is out in the stores. It's been out since, I guess, like the fall, which is, uh, if you know, me and Dan, the automator. Uh, and our handsome selves and our mustaches with a, with a ton of guests on there. Like, I can't even go through all the names. Um, we just finished actually getting off tour for that, doing that. Um, Chris Rock, Never Scared, which uh, we did a record, a whole bunch of skits and, you know, there's some live stand-up. But I have to say it's like the best Chris Rock record I've done yet, but the least advertised. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Don't ask. I have no idea. Yeah. It's on Universal. <laughs> Ask the Universal people. <laughs> um, another project is called The Dicks, and it's called it's it's D I X, and the album is called The Art of Picking Up Women, and it's uh, has a DVD with it as well, and it's bizarre, and it's I, 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 it's out on uh, a friend of mine, Mr. Len. I'm not sure if you're familiar familiar with him. He was with Company Flow um, back in the day. He was a DJ, and he has a label called Dummy Smacks, so it's out on that. Uh, the Art of Picking Up Women is really, really bizarre. I, and uh, the last thing would be an instrumental album called, it's weird, it's called It's True Mental. And it's, it's songs and music, kind of like music I've had kind of in the past, like in the archives, like from the 80s all the way to like 2000. So I just took all those instrumentals and kind of made songs out of them. So I like it. It, it, it. That's a very, very bizarre record. Like probably the last things you'll hear me in the last year or so, it's some stuff that I, I've read reviews on some of the work I've done. Like, like I said, either kids really like love it or they go, I can't get with this, man. He's bugging out, man. <laughs> so <laughs> either you're going to either fit in either or, the, or category. You won't listen to those records and go, yeah, it's all right. You're going to be like, yo, I love that. Or like, yo, he's garbage. Burn it. <laughs> <laughs> so how do, how do you feel about the mixed reviews? I mean, is it does it make you want to, you know, change at all or do you are you just like whatever you know this is how i do it no nah, i mean i can't lie it hurts you know you look at something like man but then i look at it because i think a lot of people don't get it or it's not for them you know i've never made music for people anyway i usually make it for myself like three feet high rise is a good example of that like it was there was nothing like it at it as it's you know in its time so it was a, a dangerous record to kind of make, you know, because it, it could have just made nothing. But I f we were fortunate and we sold like a, a ton of records on that. So and that's what all the records I like to be, be cutting edge like that. So with that territory, when you do that, you risk the chance of ridicule and people laughing at you. Anytime you experiment or think of something that's never been done before, it's always going to be ridicule. I mean, think about the person who said, hey, I'm going to talk to somebody on one end and they're going to pick it up on the other end and they're going to make a telephone. You know, he's crazy. <laughs> Come on, think about it in that day. Well, you know, man, I'm going to click a switch. What's a switch? <laughs> and I'm going to make a light. It's going to come off, and it's not going to be the sun. He's crazy. <laughs> so I'm that guy. I'm the guy who's thinking of all the bizarre things, and, and I risk the chance of, like, he's crazy. And hopefully with one of those things, I'll stumble onto something that, uh, yeah, I'll be crazy now, but hopefully in generations to come, my kids will be able to eat off of my patented invention <laughs> of space hip-hop. <laughs>